Hello, my name is Wayne Sedlak. I'm here with Dr. Robert Morey. We are dealing with the mind map. You should see that in your set, the problem of evil, as you have it by way of a chart. And frankly, I don't know of any other chart that is as, as, as comprehensive, biblical. Well, you'll see. We're going to discuss it at greater length. We're going to deal with that first locus, Robert, on the problem of evil, metaphysics. Yes, uh, this my approach with mind mapping is sometimes called the deductive analytic process by which you understand something. That's, so, that's defined. Deductive, de line upon line, precept upon precept. Think of the car. Here's a car. We take the car apart piece by piece to understand it so that we're deducing, we're deducting the wheel, the hubcap, the brakes, and on the floor we have the entire car right. laid out. We said, now this is what a car is. Then you understand what it is, and then you can put it back together. So when you look at the word evil, it is pregnant with meaning. The word evil has many different issues, and we are simply stripping out of the word evil the issues that are in the word itself. Now, and the first is going to be the metaphysics of evil. Let's handle with uh, some depth here. In your chart, you have different schools of thought, uh, if yes. I can use that term. For example, you have the uh, Eastern view. You have the Greek view. You have the overall the humanist view. Describe. Let's let's start with those schools. The Eastern view. Well, let's start first with the issue of existence. Right. Does evil exist? And once you make that decision, what is its nature? Now, if you've already assumed it doesn't exist, then you can't go That's exactly further. right. Then, if, once you say it exists... I define what it is, then you got to know where did it come from? Where did it come from? And what are the attributes of it? So that under metaphysics, it's not just evil, it's anything you want to talk about. Existence, its nature, its origin or source, and its attributes, those are the things that every single subject is submitted to, but we're going to do evil. Okay. We established in our first lesson, you established in our first lesson, that evil exists. Well, wait, wait, we have to, a lot we of people to... don't think that, even in Christian colleges. Understood. So you have the existence of evil, those who say, no, evil does not exist. You say, what? Yes, you must understand in Eastern philosophy, Eastern religions, be it Hinduism, which says it's an illusion, but here in America, you have the science of the mind group, the Christian science, Scientology. You have those who are saying that evil does not really exist. Uh, one time I gave a ride uh, to a lady in New York City, who was a friend of my mother-in-law, and she was the founder of a New Age church called the, I think it was called the New Age Church of Universal Understanding. All right? Mm -hmm. I'm in yes. the car with her, and she was saying, well, you must understand, Bob, God is all, all is God, God is good, all is good, there is no evil. Now, she sat there. Sure telling me there was no evil. And I said, really? There's no evil? That's an illusion because everything's good. And I reached into my pocket. Mm -hmm. And I'm driving. She said, what's that? The bell is tolling for thee. She said, I said, now, you have a key to lock your apartment. If there is no evil, why do you lock your apartment? You have a key that you keeps your car locked. Matter of fact, can I drop you off in Upper Manhattan? Oh, let's say 175th Street. 
and let you walk down a dark alley, I think you will encounter evil. So she was quieted by the reality. She had no answer. She had no answer. She can't live what she believes. That's correct. If you really believed right. that there is no such thing as evil, and I said, if someone raped my daughter, that's an illusion, there is no evil, how can she possibly live? She can't. Now, it's interesting to note that her sister, who helped her found uh, that New Age cult, jumped out of the window of their apartment there in New York City and, of course, died on the sidewalk. And I think that's an eloquent testimony that the attempt to say there is no evil, Christian science, there is no pain, there is no matter, there is no evil, Hinduism, Buddhism, all of the mind science religions is a dead end street. And they cannot cope with it, and that's why in the end it's suicidal. And so you have the tragedy of her sister jumping out of the window, you have the the potential tra tragedy of getting caught at night in a back alley, as you yeah. illustrated. You have the the despair, the discouragement of having uh, your apartment broken into. You're, uh, you were showing her there's a reality to, there's a commitment of evil, shall I say, in practice. And you better deal with it. But she didn't want to deal with it. She didn't want to deal with so it. When she we... wanted to pretend all is God, God is good, all is good. Chanting is like a mantra. I'd like you to see... That when we deal with the metaphysics of evil, as we've already just done, given its existence, to pretend it doesn't exist, we'll still have results in ethics. You just showed that. Oh, yeah. There will be bad behavior that will force you to lock your door at night. You can pretend, or you can have friends that may pretend, like this woman did. Use the illustration Dr. Bob just gave you. It's a simple one. If they wanted to find evil out of their lives and pretend they have a philosophy, they don't have to face it. Ask them why they lock their homes. Why do they lock their cars? What happens if they're walking in a dark alley at night? And what about those terrible tragedies of a lost, of a lost hope of someone that jumps? Well, Oprah had a show where she had a number of these New Age religion representatives and when they said there is no pain there is no evil she cocked her head do you do anything to alleviate evil do you have hospitals or nursing homes in your religion guess what the answer was no if you deny the existence of pain and suffering you will not found a hospital. Look you will not deal with an orphanage. You will not believe in right. helping the poor and the needy. When George Whitfield came to town and was preaching in Philadelphia, now this is the era, the generation before our war for independence. He came to Philadelphia and crime was rampant in the streets, Bob. There, uh, Benjamin Franklin testified there were orphans everywhere, no one cared. No one there were rascals in the streets, okay? <clears throat> when he preached, Three things occurred. There was a tremendous number of people on their knees crying unto God for forgiveness. He brought them Jesus Christ. But in our religion, our faith, Bob, you just hit it. The knowledge of the problem of evil, dealing, focusing on my if sins. If you don't admit it exists, you're not going to try to solve it. They did. They admitted their own sins. That's where we start. Our sinfulness but we don't stop there. And loving our neighbor, what happened with that great reformation that, that swept Philadelphia? Crime went to almost zero. That's why they proclaimed liberty throughout the land on all the inhabitants. Yes, yes. And their Jews, that's the real story behind the Liberty Bell. That's why they cited Leviticus, the law of the Lord. Because Philadelphia had already experienced a change. People were taking the orphans in. There were orphanages that were, had not existed before. There were new churches that sprang up. There were new schools that sprang up. Benjamin Franklin well, couldn't thing, get over uh, the fact there was a change. Yeah, I mean, uh, we won't go into it, but France had the most violent, bloody revolution, when, of course, with right. Madame Guillotine off 
with their hands. French Revolution. But right. England did not go through that because of the preaching of such men as Whitfield. It was called the Bloodless Revolution. Right. But, you know, uh, while we think and we look at Christian science saying there's no death, there's no sin, there's no evil, and we look at these often, we think these are crazy people, yet there's another group that say evil does not exist, and they are the Greek philosophers who say evil is the absence of good. Explain now that it. means Explain it doesn't it. exist in and of itself. It's only the absence of of good. That's why the Greeks never developed hospitals and orphanages and, and it distributed food to the poor and took care of people because evil is the absence of good. And you hear this in Christian schools. They say evil, oh, that's just the absence of good, Please note, which is nonsense. Please note what the, what the good doctor is saying here. Your metaphysics is going to generate your ethics. Or your Not. politics. Or your politics. Or Everything. it will prohibit you. You'll see no incentive. You have no incentive or have no reason. Okay. You know, Julian the Apostate, the Roman Emperor, tried to undo the influence of Christianity in the 4th century AD. The one thing he couldn't stop, he tried to, you know, the state funding of all their temples, tried to revive the Roman religions to combat Christianity. But the one thing he could not stop, he gave money to his priests and those pagan temples, he said, emulate the Christians, do works of charity. They kept the money for themselves. Yes. They had no incentive to help or love their neighbors. As a Christian, you should. You do. What we now need are answers to help with the problem of evil. You know, I love this little book, Is Eastern Orthodoxy Christian? It's the only refutation that I know of, of the Eastern Orthodox position. Yes. In there, they speak in terms of their theology, uh, ostensibly Christian, but the real substance of it's it is... It's nothing but Greek pagan philosophy. Right, it's deification. The church. Yes. It's not resurrection. They deify people. You, you yes. become like God. That's a theory of knowledge. And if that's your theory of knowledge, since man's going to evolve anyway, what's the problem? What's the problem? Well, you go through some bad days, but ultimately, if you're a universalist in it, you'll be deified. Or maybe not, but that's your choice. There is no connection, no real connection with charity and benevolence. Um, they end up being consistent with their philosophy, and some are. We're not denying that. The fact of the matter is, they even buy up so much Greek heritage, they replace biblical theology with Greek thinking. Resurrection becomes deifying man. He evolves unto a deity. His works are commitments to himself in that evolution. Instead of the biblical ethic, well, we'll deal with that when we get to All ethics. Right. Now, Let's there's say, a third way that people deny the existence of evil. So we first way, it's an illusion. I put my head in the sand like an ostrich and say, evil, what evil? The second way was, oh, I define it away. Evil is the absence of good. Thus, it doesn't really exist in and of itself. The third way is relativism. Relativism is the philosophic position taught in our colleges and universities. Nothing is really good or bad or good or evil. Um, Everything can be good and everything bad. There are no ultimate standards of right and wrong. And you can get this in any junior college. You can get this in any university. Relativism. Now, it started out in the bedroom in the 60s. That anything could go on in the bedroom and it's not, you know, if it feels good, do it. Which, of course, led to AIDS in the end and a number of things. But modern relativism says evil does not exist per se because there is no good and evil. Now that's the three ways those who deny it. Now those who say evil exists, it does. And evil exists in a way that we can understand it and deal with it, 
You find this in Judaism. You find this in Christianity because of the Bible that evil is used to describe the fallen world or man. For example, Jesus said to his disciples, if you, now the Greek is explicit, being and remaining to be evil, yet know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit if you but ask for Him? So in the biblical view, evil is real, and we have to define it in a couple of minutes, and we have to confront it and deal with it and understand it. You know, Bob, in your book, Fearing God, I love this little book. In Fearing God, in fact, you say, key to the treasure house of heaven on the, the subtitle. There are so many Christians today that deny the fact that we have to fear the Lord. Fearing God, that reverence of the soul, begins when we understand what he means by holiness, what he means by good and evil. And, of course, that's going to shine the light on my heart, which is also not very good. My sins now come into the forefront. And if I reverence the Lord and I hold him in the proper awe that I should, that's going to cause me to bend the knee and admit the existence of God in my own soul. Therein lies the portal to Jesus Christ. If that door never opens, people cannot find the Savior. They have to know and admit. You know, we can admit there's, it's easy to admit there's evil in the world, and then they finally get to it. The average person. But to admit that there's evil in my own soul, that's a break point. Either I say yes or no to that. If I fear the Lord, I understand that I will be accountable to him. And because of that, I must admit what my soul struggles with, what derails my life, where I stand, and there, there's another term, autonomous. In other words, uh, my own authority, exercise on my own terms, and uh, God is put on a shelf. He's nice to take out his insurance program. Well, when it comes to evil, uh, you stay back. I'll define what I like about evil and good. We can't do that. Your book does a great job in forcing the issue of the fear of the Lord, as showing biblically, but it See, is key to the pro this problem of evil. And it begins, God personalizes it. See, the Bible affirms evil people, evil animals, evil act, that evil exists. And then you must understand... The Bible says, now that you understand you are evil, you're part of the problem. So when a guy says, well, why can't God just say, evil, cease? Snap his fingers. I said, because we'd all be grease stains. <laughs> Poof, we would all be we'd gone. We'd be gone. We'd be gone. And Christians have to be reminded that Jesus was speaking to his disciples when he said, if you being and remaining to be evil... You've been a pastor, right. I've been a pastor, I know more about depravity from pastoring uh, churches, because Absolutely. you can find professing Christians with the greatest evils of slander, gossip, everything you could think of. We've gone through its existence, you decided it exists or it doesn't exist. What about its nature? Its nature. Well, again, the Greek philosophers and some Roman Catholics and the Mormons and others think that evil is of a material nature. It has to do with the body. So there was the Pope that went around the Vatican with a hammer knocking the penises off of oh all my. of the statues. Yes. And the idea that the original sin was sex, the body is evil, right. uh, and Plato, thereby marriage was evil. castigated. It was evil, even yes. in the early church. Well, you see, this is why the supposed virginity of Mary must be perpetual, so that she could not be defiled by her husband, Joseph. And the idea that you can't get close to God and have sex. Thus, the Mormons think the original sin was Sex. Thus, the body is evil. A body of women in evil. the Roman church are set yes. aside as 
virgins yes. who are married to Christ. And but the they priests cannot, are not supposed right. to get the married. Not. And they would flagellate. In other words, they would whip their body. Right. But the Bible says, your body's good. The body is not evil. That's right. I was asked uh, by uh, Dr. Kennedy of Coral Ridge Ministries uh, to do a paper and explain to him the difference between pornography and then statues and paintings of, of, of people without clothes, nudes. And I said, statues and paintings that show the beauty of God's creation and the beauty of the male and female form to inspire you to say, thank God we are wonderfully made. But that pornography, is art. But pornography uh, is a whole different matter. It's and it caters to the Portrayal to incite lust. Right. Totally different. But see, so many Christians think demon room. They think that material they the reality... Evil, they make the evil the material world. Yes. And, and therefore, they anathematize. Yes. But again... When your metaphysics is wrong, your commitment to behavior is going to go astray. Yes. And we're making it. God's word commits us to his commandments. We obey. We then learn from there a, a, a greater maturity in how to handle that obedience. He yes. tells us what's good and evil. That takes faith to obey him. From there, we learn the metaphysics and mature in it, don't we? Well, see, this is why we looked at whether it is evil as material, and the Bible says no. Then we look at whether evil is spiritual, and the Bible says yes. Satan, in the Lord's Prayer, delivers us from the evil one. And you right. must understand, the Bible can talk about evil spirits, evil people, even evil animals, the same people who work raw and stuff, because evil as defined according to God's law. The Bible gives us standards by which we can look at things and judge whether they are good or evil. So the Christian could say, uh, evil is a spiritual issue, demonic and human. When we have evil in the human life, it's called sin. People killing each other, people doing that to inflict pain and suffering upon each other. These are the kinds of evil uh, the Bible talks about. Now, the third issue is evil natural. Oh, that is another right. chest to open. And you have those who believe in the theory of evolution. They believe in the survival of the fittest and the claw and the tooth evolution. And they say, well, pain and suffering and evil is just part of the world. It's natural. And see, they don't understand there was a fall. The fall of man means that the world in which we live is a fallen world. So we have the origin of this problem right back there in that uh, what too many consider to be a myth, but the reality of the Garden of Eden yes. and the fall therein. When they did not obey, there's nothing wrong with the tree. Yeah, the it was the commandment. Was the fruit. It, was, the it fruit. was fruit. Just don't eat something. Don't eat it. By the way, it was attractive to her sight. Yes. Beautiful. It was desirable to her. So you see that the evil was pretty. And people must understand. But the evil was her disobedience. The e yeah, the, is listening to the devil. Right. And judging God as being a liar. Right. But see, before the fall, we did not have to deal with evil. It's when they got kicked out of the garden, man had to deal with pain, suffering, sweat by the sweat of your brow. The insects biting, the animals eating us. Sin Scarcity. is not natural. That's right. It is now in a subnormal world. So we have to say on the basis of the fall, there was a paradise, paradise lost, and the day will come when it will be paradise regained. So that we, you've given us the origin, where, where it really began. Now obviously... Satan was. We don't need to explore that at this point, but he's already evil. He tempted her. Tempted her to be, you should be as God. That's a temptation. And in all throughout this problem of evil, you have the metaphysic, unknown epistemology, a theory of knowledge. You can be as God. We just cited one, deification. You can become like God. 
uh, in Darwinism, which is really built on Hegelianism, you know, Hegel. Uh, nature builds up over time. It's all evolving. Why is it always upward? See, if it's something that's natural, then why try to change it? Right. Why try to alleviate the pain and suffering? If pain and death are natural, but they're not natural. And then lastly, the legal dimension, that when you think about evil, evil can have a legal side to it when the Bible says we can define evil by God's law. Right. If you have no standard of right and wrong, you have no way to know there is evil. Paul but says scripture that. gives us, by the law is the knowledge of sin and evil. In Romans 7, and you know, I've heard so many Christians say, well, the law of God is legalistic. Pharisee. Romans 7, Paul says, he could not know, he had not known sin but by the law. The law of the Lord defines sin. We have a whole generation trying to figure out what good and evil are. Is this good? Is that candidate good? Is this movement good? You have a whole, uh, we're awash in confusion. The Apostle Paul tells us that the law of the Lord, those commandments, granted, you know, they can't save us. I can't do enough good works to save. That's not their purpose. The law of the Lord was never designed for salvation. It gave us the knowledge right. of the problem. And it defined not the solution. us. It, that's right. It defined what well, pointed to the solution, Jesus Christ. You always well, said not that. In the law. The law the, itself left us under the condemnation of right. the law. Right. So you find you find it's defined for us. It defines the nature of sin. And it will also define righteousness. Honor mom and dad, for example. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. So it defines righteousness. It will condemn sin and define sin. How is it that in our approach to um, sin and righteousness, we neglect the very standard? How can we neglect the standard? Without a standard, you cannot judge between two things. We've looked at the existence of evil. Either it doesn't exist or it does. Right. We've looked at its nature not a material existence. It has a legal existence and a spiritual existence. It is an attribute of what we think and what we do. It is not a material substance. I cannot bring a pound of evil into the classroom. But then you have to right. discuss the origin of it. Right. The origin of evil, and in that is understood in three senses, the source, the agent, and the author, which are three different issues. The source. Three different. Well, you begin with the source, and you have one, the original evil. And the Christian has an insight from Scripture that original sin happened in the garden when Adam and Eve rebelled against God. It was not the eating of the fruit, but the disbelieving and disobeying. The moment they chose to no longer listen to God, that's when the fall of man happened. So what's so the they became, law? as we close up here, they became yes. agents to usher in evil. So Adam and Eve in their disobedience became agents, being tempted by the devil, and then there came the sanction, the fall. So we're going to come back to that in our next lesson. Dr. Bob, thank you very much. And you, please... Study the next lesson as we deal with the epistemology concerning or the theory of knowledge concerning the problem of evil. Thank you, Dr. Paul.